just want to remind you why we're here. Remember we said we're here to minister to the Lord. It's not just about those on the stage ministering to you, but you yourself seeing yourself as an active participant and saying, we want to minister to you, Lord. That was the task of the Levites in the Old Testament, is your job is just look at him and worship him and minister to him. He's a real person who receives worship, who can see with all, when, when you with all your heart are, are taking of the bread and the cup and you're going, God, I am so grateful for this. I am so dependent on this. This is the thrill of my life to commune with you that me, this sinner, can partake of the body and blood of Christ and I could be one with him. God's honored by that. It's not exciting to you that there are actually things we can do that he enjoys that he is blessed by. Do you guys like silence? Some people love it. Some people hate that I'm pausing so much because we're just used to going at such a fast pace. I love silence. I like to just sit and meditate. I don't know what it's like when you pray, but oftentimes I'll stop and I'll just imagine what God is like in silence. Just think about him sitting on his throne, the fact that right now as a human being, I wouldn't even be able to look upon him or I would just die. And I think about all of that power. I think about all of the angels up there worshiping him. Even when we were singing earlier, I was just picturing myself just with a with hundred million angels and I'm on the outskirts just looking at the throne also and I'm singing these words to him telling him how worthy he is. I love that. I don't want to be the center of attention. I just want to be behind a few angels, but staring at the throne and just screaming these words to him and blessing him and ministering to him and saying, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. I just flew in from Colorado a few minutes ago. I was doing a funeral and uh, it was awesome. Uh, someone even said afterwards, they go, you, you should just do this every day. And I said, that would be my happy place. I could do a funeral every day. Please let me do your funeral. If you know anyone that needs anyone to do a funeral, let me do the funeral. Um, I don't charge anything. I just love it. Because it's one of the few times we actually deal with real things. And we're struck with our mortality. And every funeral you're at, there was people who just go, man, he's my age, or, or we grew up together, or he's younger than me, or gosh, he just started life. Or, and, and, and you just think about it. So today, was, it was my brother-in-law, and, uh, and it was just cool. You know, recently we read uh, 2 Thessalonians as a church in our Bible reading, and it talks about those who, who aren't idle. And he says, don't, don't even hang out. Don't associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but he won't work. He's like a busybody rather than really busy and working hard with his hands. He says, make it your ambition to work hard with your hands and live a quiet life. Like it's a good thing. And that's the way my brother-in-law was. 
In fact, they took in four, uh, four kids and adopted them, raised them, and hearing them talk about their dad today, it was, it was so cool. You know, just a guy that was a mechanic, worked hard with his hands, took in kids like God. He was a father to the fatherless. And I was telling the people, gosh, if I could live my life over, I think I would be more like John and less like me. He just was okay with being in the background, serving, working hard with his hands, worshiping God, and living a life that's worthy of following. And what was really cool was a few weeks ago, they were going to, you know, he was, uh, what did you call that, uh, when you're on um, machines and you're not really coherent, yeah, kind of incoherent, you're just kind of being kept alive, and they were going to pull the plug, and so, you know, and turn off all of the machines, and and so I called his wife, Sonny, that morning, and just, just to pray for her, because I knew that's a very difficult thing to do as a wife, to go, it's time, you know, re reassuring her that, look, if God wants to do a miracle, he doesn't need the machine. It's okay. Don't feel guilty. He can save him if he really wants him to live. And so I called, and, and I'm telling her this. She goes, hey, can I put you on speakerphone? Because my daughter is here, too, and she wants to hear what you're saying. And they're right there with John's body in between them. And she just laid my phone, her, her phone on his chest. And... I said, John, if you can hear me, I'm praying for you right now. We're coming to the presence of God, and we're going to pray right now. And right then, his wife says, he, he's, he's opening his eyes, and he's looking right at me. I'm okay, okay, John. And I'm just like praying to God, and I'm telling John, I go, John, this is going to be the greatest moment you've ever felt, the greatest day of your existence. And then she tells me, tears are coming down his eyes right now. And I'm just praying and just telling God, God, this is good. This is a good moment. This is what we live for. As he's crying. Then soon after that, the rest of the kids showed up. John was able to look at his wife one last time. No sound could come out of his mouth. He just mouthed the words, I love you. Boom. And he went in the presence of God. What is that moment like? What's that going to be? Like, like, we've got to think about this. Like I said, I, either last week or the week before, I go, what I want from this is I want to prepare you for that moment. It's the most important second of your existence. When this life is over, and boom, you're right before a holy God. What is that going to feel like? It's any moment for any of us. And we need to think about it. I know I've been talking about like really believing we're in the end times and people go, God, you believe that? I go, yeah, but at my age, it doesn't matter. It's end times one way or another. You know, you just get to a point where you're like, it, it just is the end times, period. And, and I think about that day. And I was, um, I wasn't going to share about this, but, you know, in Ecclesiastes, I, I was reading, uh, sharing this morning from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, where he says, a good name is better than precious ointment. 
just something about a good name. It's a good thing. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of birth. Okay, this, these are the words of Solomon, the wisest man on earth. And he says, the day of death is better than the day of birth. And I, and I held out the, you know, the little uh, whatever program that they give at the, at, the, at the memorial service. And I go, you know how it, it puts the guy, you know, the, the date of when he was born and the day when he, when he passed. And I'm like, look, that bottom date. That's the awesome date, according to Solomon. This is the better date. Not the day you were born, but the day you die. It's a good day. And then verse 2, he says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. This is the wisest man on earth. He says, hey, it's better to go to the house where people are just bawling their eyes out. The house of mourning. It's better to go there than to the house of feasting. This is deep. Can you ever get excited? Um, okay, I love Asian food. Surprise. And, and there are times when I know I'm going to go somewhere and I'm just going to gorge myself on the best Asian food. I know who's cooking or where we're eating and it's just going to be, I look forward to that. I really do. You know, and for some of you, maybe it's, you know, a good Subway sandwich, you know, but uh, fried chicken. Uh, so, so we're going. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. Okay, you're vegan, right? Not anymore? You eat meat now? Oh, okay. I thought you looked healthier. It's brighter. Okay. It's good for you. Okay. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I, just, I just love, I love a good Asian meal. That's just what I'm into. But here he says, uh, it's actually better than going to a party with all the best food and everything else, it's better to be in a house of mourning. There's something that is so good for us to be in the house of mourning. And so when I think about what he says, I go, you know what? I actually agree with him. Like, I would rather, I mean, as much as I look forward to having, you know, all my friends together and having a great meal together, and that's why I'm not kidding. Like, I, I, I really enjoy memorial services. I really love when we're all together and we're actually thinking about something that matters and we're dealing with eternity because, because I care about people. I love people, and, and so often we're just thinking about so many stupid things, and we're not thinking about that most important second of our lives, me in the presence of him. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Again, it's uncomfortable, but at most Asian funerals, it's open casket. And, and it's weird to go up and see the body of someone you love, and it's just, it's not the same. You know, they got the makeup on, the flesh. They try, you know, the guy who does all that stuff tries to make the body. It never looks right, and you're just like, ah. And, and a lot of people don't, don't want to go forward. I mean, they didn't do it today. He was a white guy. But, uh, <laughs> and I know some of you guys do that too. But in, in Chinese funerals, like, that's a big thing. You walk up, and I remember as a kid seeing my mom, and as a kid seeing my dad in the casket, and closing it up and lowering it in the ground and 
There's something that is so sobering and difficult to watch. But it says that this is the end for all man. And the living will lay it to heart. There's just something good for my soul to go. That's going to be me any day. Now, in our culture here in America, we go, wow, you're talking about some really morbid things. But that's not the way Solomon talks about it. It's just reality. This is life. This is our destiny. So it's good to stay in the house of mourning. Verse 3, he says, sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. Sorrow is better than laughter. Again, I love to laugh. There's, I, this is one of my favorite, is laughing to where tears come out. I don't know the last time, and the Bible's not against that. The Bible says laughter is good medicine. It's good when you are laughing so hard that the tears are coming out. It's just, it's the best, just stupid, stupid things that you just laugh at. And, and afterwards, there's just like, oh, you just feel lighter, right? You just feel so good. With all the pressures in the world and everything else, there's nothing like laughing to the point of tears. But he says sorrow is even better than that. Sorrow is better than laughter. Remember last week we talked about godly sorrow? And I was praying for a miracle that God would give us godly sadness. Because there's something so great about godly sadness. It's a gift. When you see your own sin and you don't just feel like shrugging your shoulders like no big deal or you're callous to it. Man, that's a, that, is, that is so horrible. That is terrifying when you can sin and not feel it. Not feel the weight of it. That's why the scriptures say that today, if you can hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't let your heart grow calloused. I don't know if you guys have ever picked up a guitar and tried to play it, but those who, I remember when I first was learning how to play guitar, I played it um, till my fingers bled. That's a song, huh? It's the summer of 69. And, and we, I played that guitar, you know, I just, I just wanted to get it down so bad that I just kept playing and playing, but I wasn't, it hurt so bad, and suddenly you're, you're seeing blood. And, but you keep playing, and pretty soon, the next time it hurts less and less and less, and pretty soon you develop these things. I don't have them anymore because I don't play anymore. Um, you develop these things called calluses to where you can play guitar. You don't even feel it on your fingertips anymore. See, the Bible says that can happen to your heart. That you may feel so much pain the first time you sin. You're so convicted about a certain particular sin. It just was like, oh, I did that to God. You confess it. You repent. You do it again. You're like, ah, oh, I did that. I'm so sorry. You do it again. Ah. Again. Again. And pretty soon, you're looking back. You're like, man, I used to be so sad about this. And now I don't even feel it. There's a godly sorrow as so I was saying, the times when God's convicted me and I'm just bawling my eyes out of how offensive my sin. That was a good thing. This last Sunday, we're looking at, uh, you remember that story in, in Luke chapter 7, where the woman, you know, who was uh, not a good woman, had not lived a great life, but had been forgiven by Jesus. She is on her feet. I mean, she was on her knees at Jesus' feet. And she's weeping. 
This woman is crying, crying, and her tears are just spilling all over Jesus' feet. And the religious leaders are looking at her like, what are you doing? And Jesus, do you know who that is? You know what kind of past that woman has? And she's, and she's bawling, at, and they're just kind of like grossed out by it. Look at her making a spectacle of herself. And God explains to everyone around, you don't get it. Those who have been forgiven much, love much. So you guys think your life, you've lived a pretty good life. So when we talk about forgiveness, you're like, yeah, that's... I, no, but if you really felt the weight of your sin, that's a gift from God. You're going, God... I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be in this room ministering to you. I know the things that I have done. And when God gives you that grace of sorrow, of pain, to where you can cry, that's a gift. Because you recognize your own sinfulness. And then you can become like that woman and love. My, I mean, isn't that the goal? That we'd be such strong lovers of God? Well, the Bible says you love much when you've realized you've sinned much. And God has forgiven you of that. And so here he's saying sorrow is better than laughter. A good cry over the right things is actually better than laughter. For by sadness of the heart, or sadness of the face, the heart is made glad. Then verse 4 says, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. The heart of the wise, so where your heart stays, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. That's why I, did, I don't really want to leave that memorial service I was just at. I don't want to transition to another topic. I think that's what I'm wrestling with. I said, well, God, I, I want to feel the weight of that body. I want to feel the weight of, of a friend of mine who's, who's not here anymore. I want to feel the weight of, of, of saying goodbye to your family and then going into your presence. I want to feel the pain of missing someone. He says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Look, I have done so many funerals. And something I notice, a trend that started happening, especially when young people die, is uh, people are so anxious to uh, get drunk afterwards. Um, I mean, I, I start doing these funerals where these people would talk about it. And even as they're giving their eulogies, they'll say things like, I know what he would want us to do. He wants us to party today and party hard, yeah. You know, and they just go and, and let's, so after this, we're going to throw the biggest rage. We're going to get so wasted, so bombed out of our minds. I mean, they'll say this, you know, during the eulogies. Like, let's get wasted because this is what he would want. This is what she would want. And she'll be right there with us. And, and it is crazy, some of the memorial services I've done, where people are coming in and they're just dressed like ready to party. Not in a good way. I mean, the girls and these little skirts and everything else. and the guy, It's just like, we're going to have a party right after this. Why? Because the Bible says the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It's, it's uncomfortable. You know, it's like, can you change the subject? Just, just say something funny. Lighten this up a little bit. 
Why? Because it's uncomfortable to us. But the Bible is saying the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Something I notice in uh, Solomon's writings, Jesus' writings, it's, it's like the exact opposite of what the world teaches, like polar opposite. You know, like these are weird words to us. The day of death is better than the day of birth. I mean, how thrilled were you? Those of you who are parents, the day your child was born. You know? You had a little baby shower and, you know, all that other stuff. It's a thrill. And so this just seems so backwards. Just like when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn now. But he says, woe to those who laugh. Woe to those who are rich. Woe to those who are living in luxury. They got everything. It's the exact opposite of what God teaches what the world teaches. We live in a time when people don't talk about God as holy and sacred. They bring him down to our level. The whole Jesus is my homeboy. He's just one of us rather than recognizing, no, he is so far beyond you. We live in a time when everyone wants to tell you you're a good person. You're a good person. You've done, you've done good things. You're, you're better than I am. Don't be so hard on yourself. You're a good person. It's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. That in sin our mothers conceived us. And God says all of us have sinned. All of us fall short of the glory of God. And again, we live in a time when people say a loving God will not punish. That if he's a loving God, how could he ever pour out his wrath? That doesn't make sense. And yet scripture is filled with his judgment. Again, it's, it's the opposite of what everyone teaches. Because the truth is, is if God is not holy, and I am not bad, and he does not judge, why do I need the cross? Why, why are we taking communion? It's just a little God we're going to run into up there who's just like us, and we'll just argue with him and explain to him, oh, no, no, I'm a good person, and you're supposed to be loving, so you can't, you can't punish me. So why do I need this? Why would he send his one and only son to die on a cross? But the truth is, is he is holy, and there's no way a human being can just come into his presence or even get close to him. And the truth is, is I'm a rotten sinner and the thoughts. And that's why we confess those things with people who've been confessing those things for hundreds of years before we took communion. And we just talked about our sin in word, in thought, in deed. Offensive to a holy God. A God who is coming back to judge. And pour out in Revelation, it says, is the undiluted wrath of God. And he's been storing up wrath. And that's why we come to the table and go, this is the best news ever. That God is a loving, merciful, gracious God and sent his son to pay the penalty for all of my crimes. just want us all to be ready when that day comes. 
Because the truth is, is that every funeral you go to in America, the guy up front says, oh, he's in a better place. She's in a much better place. It doesn't matter who it is. That's just their standard statement. And it's just not always true. Jesus says there's a narrow road that leads to life, and few will find it. And it's a difficult road. And there's a wide, easy path that leads to destruction, and many will enter through it. That's the sobering reality. That's the world we live in. And something that I was very grateful for years ago, I would think about serious things. Like even in high school when I first became a Christian, I remember I'd walk down the lock, you know, through the locker halls. We had lockers. I don't know if they still do that. But uh, I would just look at all my classmates and picture them standing before God without forgiveness. And it would just freak me out. And I would just every day try to talk to one of my friends because the thought of them being separated from God and facing their punishment was just too much for me. It, it made me so sad. It just did. It just made me sick. And so I would talk to them. But then eventually I started working in a church and being around church people and most of my friends became Christians and were Christians. And I just hung around church people. And somehow I just lost that sadness because I didn't see the sadness. I didn't hang out with the sadness. And I remember in the middle of seminary, I, I ended up waiting tables at a restaurant. And... Uh, And I just fell in love with all my coworkers. You know, if any of you ever worked in a restaurant, it's like, it's the best. You just become like this family with the people you serve with, the hostesses, the bartenders, the busboys. You know, after every shift, like, everyone's stressed out. And we'd go to some bar and everyone would get drunk. And then I would drive them home and uh, preach to them as I'm driving. And, you know, but I remember one night just getting home. And I just started weeping again because I thought about these people and I'm going, God, you can't let Ron go. You can't let Lori go to hell. You can't let Harmit go to hell. You can't. I just started naming all of my friends and just crying. And I was like, God. And suddenly it was like, oh, I'm back to the old me where I cared about people. And I wept for people. And I'm just noticing in my life, I'm starting to lose it again. Oh God, I, I, don't, I don't mourn like I used to. My heart doesn't stay in the house of mourning. It's too easy to turn on Netflix and get your mind on something else. It's too easy to just look at a video. It's too easy to find out how the warriors are doing or the, everything's just right there to just snap you out of it. Don't stay in the house of mourning. Entertain yourself. Don't think about deep things, meaningful things. Just binge watch something and get your mind off of all that. That's the world we're living in. And that's why I'm just praying. I'm praying for a seriousness to fall upon us. And that's okay. And even a sadness that falls upon us. That's okay. To even be in the house of mourning. To grieve over the things that grieve the heart of God. This is not to bum us out. It's actually to give us life. Because that's what Solomon says. It's like the right type of sad face causes your heart to actually become happy. 
And I don't want to leave last week, you know? We talked about godly sorrow, godly sadness, and just have some time to reflect. And um, I just want us to take some time now. We have some space, we have some time. Just be quiet. Think about life. Think about preparing ourselves to come into the presence of God. Maybe someone can lead us, you know, or play or something. And then Rob or any of the elders, as you feel like the Lord is leading us to do something, we'll just go for it. One of the things we prayed about this week was let's give people some space and let's give space for the Holy Spirit to move in this room. I think too often as leaders, we almost try to lead the Holy Spirit into doing something, what we think he should do tonight, rather than like be disciples of Christ who show up and just go, where are you going to take us today? Father, we believe you are in this room with us. Holy Spirit, we believe you are in our presence. Jesus, we took the bread and the cup and we believe in your real presence in this room right now. So, Father, guide us now. Tell us what would bless your heart, what would minister to you. We just surrender this time to you, Lord.
Hãy subscribe